we're going to step into a world of unwavering determination as we unveil the top 15 most stubborn homeowners who resisted the tides of change and clung to their properties against all odds. These homeowners stood firm against developers and demonstrate an unyielding commitment to their homes. Let's begin with number 15, Edith Macefield. All right, kicking off this list of modern-day folk heroes is Edith Macefield. She was an ordinary woman with an extraordinary spirit, and she etched her name into the history books through an act of resolute defiance. In the midst of Seattle's rapid urban transformation, Edith stood as a steadfast symbol of resistance, a tiny home on the brink of being swallowed by the relentless tide of development. Amidst the soaring skyscrapers and bustling streets, her small house would become the embodiment of her unwavering commitment to the familiar, the past, and the values that make a place a true home. The Ballard Blocks Project, a testament to modernity, loomed large around her, offering piles of cash to lure her away from her beloved abode, but Edith's answer was a resounding no. Her story transcended the confines of real estate battles, and it became a rallying cry for preserving the soul of a community, for cherishing the places that tell a story of the past, and for standing firm in the face of change. She demonstrated that sometimes the greatest strength lies in staying put, in being an unwavering beacon among the chaos of progress. As she peacefully passed away in 2008, her house, surrounded but untouched, stood as a monument to her resilience, a testament to the idea that the intangible ties that bind us to our homes are stronger than the allure of material wealth or the grandeur of modernity. Number 14. Vera Koking Vera Koking, the tenacious lady from Atlantic City, wrote her own chapter in the saga of standing up to the bigwigs when she took on none other than Donald Trump. Nestled in the heart of prime real estate, Koking's three-story house on South Columbia Place became the epicenter of a battle that David might have nodded approvingly at, ready to take on a Goliath in a glittering suit. It was the 90s, and Trump had grand visions of expanding his Atlantic City casino empire. Vera's house was an inconvenient obstacle, a little slice of defiance amidst the dazzling Trump Plaza Hotel. But Vera wasn't having it. The offers, the pressure, the allure of hefty sums of cash all brushed aside with a spirit as fierce as the ocean waves just beyond her doorstep. The legal showdown that ensued played out like a high-stakes poker game, and the entire east coast of the United States was tuned in. Eminent domain, that legal jargon usually reserved for the greater good, found itself in the ring, facing off against an ordinary person's extraordinary resolve. The media circus surrounding Vera's battle with Trump was more than just a legal tussle. It was a symbolic clash, an underdog story that had everyone rooting for the everyday folks, the ones who just want to live in peace. Better yet, Vera Koking won the day, and both she and her house stayed put. Number 13. Portland Figo House Acker and Associates embarked on a captivating journey when they chose the historic Figo House as their new home in downtown Portland back in 2005. This unique building, dating back to 1894 and applauded by the State Historic Preservation Office for its Queen Anne architectural charm, became a battleground and a showdown with the local transportation authority, TriMet. TriMet, wielding the power of eminent domain, aimed to acquire the property to fuel their ambitious Portland Mall project, a plan that included the construction of tracks for a brand new Max train line, an essential addition of the bustling heart of Portland. Simultaneously, under wraps, TriMet was in secret negotiations with Portland State University, discussing transferring the land for the construction of a sprawling dormitory, a significant part of the university's expansion dreams. Acker and Associates, not willing to let the Figo House become another chapter in the book of lost historical gems, sprang into action. Their efforts ranged from intense investigations, tense negotiations, and strategic meetings with a diverse array of stakeholders, including city, state, and federal agencies, neighborhood organizations, and historical preservation advocates. Capturing attention with extensive media coverage, along with the eye-catching pamphlets and buttons proudly proclaiming, Save the Figo House! After a hard-fought battle with twists and turns, TriMet eventually relented. In February 2008, they officially surrendered, notifying Acker and Associates that the Figo House was safe from their clutches. The property's fate was then transferred to PSU, albeit with some key exceptions, including portions for the TriMet tracks and, most notably, the historic Figo House itself. Number 12. 
Guangzhou Overpass. Three Chinese families became the embodiment of resistance when motorway builders sought to pave their way through a Guangzhou neighborhood. The construction was designed to connect the city's road network to a newly opened tunnel beneath the Pearl River, but not all residents were willing to give up their homes for compensation packages. The stand resulted in a remarkable display of defiance and resolve. But because when you're living somewhere your entire life, it's not just so easy to get up and go. Rather than demolishing the houses, the construction company decided to encircle them with a sprawling four-lane flyover. Perhaps out of spite, these homes, aptly called nail houses, became the talk of the town, with a viral photograph showcasing the unusual scenario resembling a spaghetti junction-like structure weaving around the residents. It made for a pretty insane sight on the outside, so just imagine what it must be like on the inside of there. The home became somewhat of a regional internet sensation, and opinions on the matter were diverse. One local media executive humorously remarked that the authorities had gifted the locals with 360-degree road views, while others criticized the homeowners, labeling them as greedy for holding out or what some believed to be unreasonable amounts of compensation. But I can't judge these people until I've walked a mile in their shoes, or in this case, lived a few years in their house. These types of cases aren't so cut and dry. After failing to convince the homeowners to vacate the premises, the local authorities agreed to build an acoustic barrier around the remaining community. This marked the end of the battle for the houses, but residents were given the opportunity to change their minds and accept the compensation if they wished to do so. Number 11. Spiegelhalter's Jewelers Nestled amidst the grandeur of neoclassical giants, the diminutive Spiegelhalter Jewelry and Clock Shop on London's Mile End Road boasts a tale of tenacious defiance. Its unassuming 19th century frontage, dwarfed by Wickham's department store, embodies a story of resilience that dates back to the 1920s. Back then, Wickham's, in pursuit of Selfridge's S. Grandeur, sought to buy out the Spiegelhalter shop. But the Spiegelhalters, with their lineage reaching back to Baden and having established a presence on Mile End Road since the early 19th century, wouldn't yield. They stood strong, resisting any offer to knock down their shop. The result? Wickham's sprawling department store had to adapt, shaping its architecture around the determined little shop. It's a charming quirk of history. The store became asymmetrical as its center tower had to be shifted to accommodate the Spiegelhalter shop. Fast forward nine decades and the story continues. Over 2,700 people rallied behind the cause, throwing their names on a petition to preserve what's left of the Spiegelhalter frontage. Developers in a refreshing nod to heritage have decided to keep the first floor facade, which will gracefully arch over the entrance of a new office and accommodation complex. Many local people emphasize the importance of maintaining individual buildings to prevent a sense of dislocation in a city where uniformity often reigns. The Spiegelhalter shop, a survivor that withstood Hitler's blitz, remains a testament to the indomitable spirit of those who resist conformity. In Nairn's London, a renowned topographical work, Ian Nairn humorously dubbed the Spiegelhalter shop, quote, a perennial triumph for the little man, the blokes who won't conform, end quote. It has become a quirky landmark, a small but significant piece of London's cultural heritage. While times change and Wickham's eventually sold, the Spiegelhalters held out until 1982, leaving their mark as an off-license establishment. Today, Tesco Metro and Sports Direct occupy the ground floor of the old department store, while the Spiegelhalter shop first floor facade and enduring survivor stands as a nod to the past. Number 10. The Wu Family Nail House The Wu Family Nail House, a remarkable story of standing strong against the tide of rapid urban development, captured the attention of China and the world in recent years. Sadly, when these urban developments aimed to propel a city forward, they still managed to leave many people behind. But the Wu family said, not today and not us, in the face of that sentiment. It all started in 2004, as developers set their sights on crafting a sprawling shopping mall in the vibrant landscape of Chongqing in China. They embarked on a mission to clear the land by purchasing the properties of 280 local homeowners. However, they hadn't accounted for the unyielding resolve of Wu Ping and her husband Yang Wu, who stood their ground, determined to retain their two-story brick house even in the face of pressure. This couple's story swiftly transformed into a symbol of the tug of war between homeowners and property developers, a poignant narrative playing out across China as traditional farmland makes way for the rapid rise of office buildings and industrial parks. 
But the Wu family defied the odds, refusing to bow down even as the developers excavated the land around their cherished abode, reportedly resorting to intimidation tactics. But matters such as this aren't always about being obstinate. It's about safeguarding their fundamental rights as citizens. They held fast to their dwelling, enduring the harsh realities of life without electricity or water. Tough times indeed. But that pressure created diamonds as Yang's ingenious makeshift stairway reaching up from the 10-meter pit surrounding their home became a symbolic act of defiance, crowned by the fluttering Chinese flag atop the roof. The family even took the battle to the public, conducting press conferences to raise awareness of their plight. Essential supplies like food, water, and even quilts and blankets made their way to Yang through an ingenious system of ropes and pulleys. So how did it all end? Well, after an arduous struggle spanning three years, the change was on the horizon. China introduced a groundbreaking law, a protector of private property rights, and the indomitable couple, recognizing the significance of this turning point, accepted an apartment of similar size in a downtown location. Number 9. Café Chez Salah Salah Ojani, a 71-year-old Algerian-born business owner in northern France, has become a symbol of resilience and attachment to his heritage as he steadfastly refuses to sell the coffee house he's owned for 46 years. This unassuming two-story triangular building, known as Café Chez Salah, stands alone in the aftermath of an air raid that wiped out the surrounding neighborhood in Rubai. Despite receiving numerous offers for his property, Ujani remains unwavering in his determination to preserve the place where he's invested his life work. Ujani's story goes beyond simple property ownership. It's a testament to his deep connection to the cafe, its memories, and the community it once served. After arriving in France in 1949, he worked diligently for years before purchasing the building with his wife, Jeanette, in 1965. The café, frozen in time with its faded curtains, vintage jukebox, and yellowed photos, holds the echoes of a bygone era when the streets here were bustling with people from various walks of life. While the neighborhood underwent significant changes, with the land bought up for redevelopment and the closure of factories, Ojani's refusal to sell his café has been a source of tension for developers. The ambitious Union Eco District project covering 80 hectares aimed at housing 240,000 people. It clashed with Ujani's steadfast commitment to his coffee house. As the project advanced towards completion in 2022 with a staggering investment of 174 million euros, developers have faced an unexpected roadblock, Salah Ujani's unyielding resolve. Despite facing difficulties such as interrupted utilities and a diminishing customer base, Ujani continues to serve patrons in his cafe unaffected by the turmoil around him. Developers have reluctantly adjusted their plans to incorporate the cafe into the project, realizing that convincing Ojani to move is an impossible feat, at least in the present, while they may hope to persuade his descendants in the future. For now, Ojani's commitment to preserving his piece of history clearly remains unshaken. Number 8. Jung Mei Ju This stubborn homeowner on our list is as brave as they come, but her story is quite sad. Zhang Mei Zhu, a resident in Zhejiang province in China, is yet another person living in one of these nail houses. Her apartment is situated in what was once a large block of flats targeted for demolition to make way for a new business plaza. However, Zhang's stand is fueled by her dissatisfaction with the compensation being offered to her for relocating. The developers initiated the demolition of the block of flats, but they faced an unexpected obstacle when they reached her apartment, located at the end of the building. Her tenacity prevented them from tearing down the last section of the building, leaving her apartment intact. Despite the challenging circumstances, she's lived without running water and electricity for a year, demonstrating her resilience. Her daily routine has been profoundly affected by the lack of essential utilities in her apartment. She makes the daily trip to her friend's house to collect buckets of water, highlighting the extent to which she's adapted her lifestyle to cope with the basic living conditions she now faces. Her resilience is a testament to her commitment to her home, and she's determined to ensure that her apartment is not secretly dismantled. The buckets lining the hallway of her flat are a visual reminder of her perseverance, even as she spends much of her time at her friend's place seeking respite from the heat. Each day, Zhang Weizhu returns to her apartment to check that it hasn't been secretly torn down. Her vigilance underscores the lengths to which she's willing to go to protect her home. 
Her story highlights the complex issues surrounding property rights, compensation, and urban development in China, her determination to resist the demolition, and her willingness to endure those conditions to protect her home. It reflects a narrative of individual rights and the negative impacts of developers on local residents. Her situation resonates with those who value the preservation of personal spaces and the recognition of the human side, or lack thereof, of such transformative projects. Moving on to number seven. Takao Shito. Should you ever find yourself flying in or out of Japan's Narita Airport, look down, look carefully, and see if you can spot this stubborn landowner. Patches of farmland and quaint houses are sitting snug amidst the taxiways, a stark contrast to the bustling air travel hub. This intriguing arrangement is a result of steadfast resistance from local farmers during the airport's development, leading to the airport being constructed around the lands of those who refuse to relocate. This story reveals much about the history of the airport development in Japan, and the power of land rights and the resilience and values of its people. Airports obviously typically require vast open spaces for runways, taxiways, and aircraft storage, with stringent security measures in place too. It's therefore surprising to find functional farms and residences within the confines of Narita International Airport. This agricultural haven currently hosts five operational farms, continuing to cultivate produce and supply it locally. Remarkably, this farmland predates the construction of the airport, dating back to a time when the area was predominantly rural. The airport expansion dilemma emerged as Haneda Airport, Tokyo's primary aviation hub, faced capacity limitations by the 1960s. The imminent arrival of larger jet aircraft, including the iconic 747, coupled with the removal of travel restrictions for Japanese citizens, prompted the Japanese government to consider options for accommodating that growth. The chosen site near the village of Tomisato in Chiba Province, far from central Tokyo, offered ample space for the construction and potential expansion, aiming to mitigate pollution and noise issues that had plagued Haneda, initially built before the jet age. The saga of Narita Airport's coexistence with these farms and the ongoing legacy of resistance are profound, and one man seems to stand at the forefront, Takao Shito. Shito was offered a compensation of 180 million yen, or the equivalent of about 1.7 million. To other families, they refused to move, or were likely offered the same. For him, it was not about the money. He was determined to stay no matter what. Cut to today, and the number of households has dwindled from 28 to just 5. Shito continues to farm, assisted by around 10 volunteers, many of them former protesters themselves. He still says he loves the land, and with the slowdown in aviation in 2020, it's been even better for him, with less pollution and less noise. Number 6. Toronto Half House Note, this isn't a Photoshop trick, or is it the world's nastiest spite house. Rather, this bona fide half-home shares more with its nailhouse brethren after witnessing a history of blight and zoning changes. The lone row home at 54 and a half St. Patrick Street dates back to Toronto's slums in the late 19th century. But somewhere between 1890 and 1893, this bay and gabled relic from a bygone era was one of six identical, structurally intertwined homes on what was then known as Doomer Street. Times passed, the street names changed, and a particularly sharky land holdings company began buying up property throughout the neighborhood in the middle of the 20th century. Eventually, the owners of the row houses caved, but not as a unit. Each half of the row houses' homes were torn down at an excruciatingly slow pace, until 54 and a half remained the only one left. This begs the question, how does half a building cleave away so cleanly only to leave the rest of it standing? Well, very carefully. In a miraculous feat performed with clumsy and powerful machinery, a demolition crew managed to tear down 54 and a half's neighbor to the north with such precision as to not disturb any of the original facade on the building that was to remain. The white exterior had all once been a load-bearing wall hidden internally to divide the neighbor's bedrooms and living rooms from each other. One slip with an excavator and the half house would have come tumbling down. As of 2013, the house was reported to be privately owned and vacant. As it begins to show signs of wear, its status as the last bastion of the neighborhood's less pleasant days is beginning to show on its craggy half-face. And again, if any house has earned its character, it's this one. Number 5. Gate Tower Building all right, for the most part, 16-story buildings in Osaka don't stick out that much. That is, unless, of course, a highway cuts right through them, allowing cars to race through the 5th, 6th, and 7th floors. The Hanshin Expressway is a 149-mile network of expressways running around the Japanese city of Osaka, Kobe, and Kyoto. 
The highway's most famous and unique feature is a small section of road that passes directly through three floors of an office building. Back in the early 1980s, plans were underway to redevelop the deteriorating area Fukushima Kuosaka. The project had been approved and local property owners were eagerly awaiting their building permits. But then a rather large obstacle emerged. A major extension of the Hanshin Expressway had already been given the go-ahead, and its planned route took it right through the redevelopment area. Local property owners refused to budge, creating a five-year period of negotiation. This resulted in a change in city and highway planning laws to accommodate the unified development of highways and buildings in the same space. This in turn required some innovative thinking, especially when it came to a stretch of road that somehow needed to pass by a 16-floor office building. The solution resulted in one of the strangest looking sights in the world. The side of the Gate Tower building simply opens up like a mouth to release traffic coming off the Hanshin Expressway. Futuristic looking and against all classic notions of creating high-rises, the Gate Tower building is actually the result of a compromise between the Japanese government and landowners who had a stake in a claim on the land back in the mid-19th century. Amazingly, the highway hardly affects business inside the Gate Tower building, as the owners installed noise-proof walls and flooring. Visitors entering the ground floor of the building will see the elevator marked with floors number 1 to 4 and then 8 to 16. The floors in between simply say Hanshin Expressway and are naturally inaccessible. The elevators run on the outside of the building so they can easily pass by the road, which is covered, soundproofed, and doesn't actually touch the building at all as it runs through it. The highway is instead held up on pillars, which were designed to complement the facade of the building. Office workers therefore aren't continually disturbed by the whoosh-whoosh of passing traffic and their coffee cups remain static, rather slowly vibrating across the table. Number 4. The Thirsty Beaver The Thirsty Beaver Saloon is an unassuming one-story brick neighborhood dive bar that serves only canned and bottled beer, plays only old country music, and often screens the classic western series Hee Haw silently on loop. The side of the building is adorned with a crudely painted cartoon beaver in a Stetson hat and cowboy boots, clutching a tipping pint glass, and there are usually a number of Harley-Davidson motorcycles parked out front. It may not seem like much, but pull back a bit and it's not hard to notice that the saloon is hugged by developments on all sides. In 2015, the barren concrete land surrounding the Thirsty Beaver was sold to the powerful construction conglomerate Campus Works Development for a staggering $8.5 million. The transaction was orchestrated by the local businessman and property owner John Hatcher, whose intent was to pave the way for ambitious new projects in the area. However, there was a significant snag in this lucrative deal, a seemingly unyielding obstacle that came in the form of George Salem, the venerable owner of that beloved bar. George's family had held ownership of this beloved dive for generations, and he was not willing to let it go, even in the face of immense pressure. Brian Wilson, a key figure in the Thirsty Beaver's story, describes how Hatcher continues to assert his power, attempting to steamroll not only the elderly Mr. Salem, but also Brian and his brother. Despite this adversity, a remarkable sense of solidarity emerged among the Wilson brothers and Mr. Salem. They made a resolute pact to stand their ground, firmly refusing to relinquish the space that held immense sentimental value to them all. Hatcher's attempt to sway them included offering alternative locations for the bar, but the trio remained unwavering in their decision. In interviews, Brian Wilson claimed Hatcher continued to emphasize, it's just business, to which Brian countered, yeah, it's our business. It became evident that Hatcher's motivations were linked to a deal with the construction conglomerate, CW Development, contingent on removing the Thirsty Beaver from the equation. What unfolded was pure magic. The trio had grown weary of witnessing their beloved city transformed by towering skyscrapers and impersonal apartment complexes. Gentrification had already taken its toll, pushing out small business owners in favor of chain stores and towering structures. They realized that the uniqueness of their cherished neighborhood was at stake, and seeing how the bar is still standing strong, albeit in the shadow of high-rises, it's obvious to see who the real winners are. And cheers to the Thirsty Beaver. Number 3. Austin L. Spriggs Spite House Larry David may have opened a spite store, but Austin L. Spriggs built a real-life spite house. His spite house is an intriguing and legendary structure located in Alexandria, Virginia, and it embodies the essence of a spite house in the most captivating way. This unique architectural oddity stands as a testament to human persistence, stubbornness, and a touch of humor. 
The story behind this house is often referred to as the Skinny House, and it captivates the imagination. The tale dates back to the early 19th century. Legend has it that in the 1830s, a man named John Hollinsbury owned a parcel of land in a prime location. It was a valuable piece of real estate, nestled between two more substantial properties, and it was on this small slice of land that he decided to build a house. Not for himself, but to irritate his neighbors. The neighbors in question, Austin L. Spriggs and his wife, had previously attempted to purchase the land from Hollinsbury, but had been unsuccessful. In an act of retaliation, or simply to obstruct their view, Hollinsbury chose to construct a house that was only seven feet wide, effectively preventing any grand building plans Spriggs might have had. The result was a house that is perhaps one of the narrowest and most hilarious in the United States, a three-story, tiny, yet fully functional home that became an enduring symbol of spite and determination. Its exterior, characterized by that sliver-like dimensions, attracted the attention and curiosity of locals and tourists, earning it the moniker of the Spite House. Now, despite that diminutive size, the house was designed with surprising efficiency, featuring a living area, kitchen, and a bedroom, all stacked on top of each other like a vertical jigsaw. It's a charming, yet bizarre sight, a dwelling that sort of defies the conventional architectural norm and stands out as an unconventional symbol. The Spite House has remained an iconic fixture in Alexandria's historic old town, serving as a reminder of a bygone era. It's a testament to the lengths some individuals are willing to go to assert their will, leaving an indelible mark on the landscape. The house has become a favorite among tourists seeking a glimpse of this remarkable oddity, and it's a point of pride for those who appreciate the quirkier aspects of history, offering a charming contrast to the grandeur of nearby buildings. Number 2. The Million Dollar Corner in the heart of bustling New York City at the iconic intersection of 34th Street and Broadway, a five-story building stands as an unyielding testament to the complex dynamics of real estate and business rivalry. This unassuming structure, often overshadowed by the grandeur of its neighbor, Macy's Department Store, has had a storied history that weaves together ambition, competition, and a strategic maneuver that's left an indelible mark on the city's landscape. The saga of this building began in the early 1900s, when Macy's, already a significant presence on West 14th Street, set its height on Herald Square for a groundbreaking retail endeavor. The company was actively acquiring land to create a colossal shopping destination that would solidify its position as a retail giant. However, fate had a twist in store, as Macy's was on the verge of finalizing its plans for the coveted corner, an astute agent managed to secure the plot, putting a wrench in Macy's aspirations. The building on this corner, a five-story structure, had already been purchased by a determined individual named Robert H. Smith. The sum he paid for the property, a staggering $375,000 in that time, reflected the significance of the location and its potential impact on Macy's ambitions. Macy's, however, proved to be as resilient as the city it called home. Undeterred by the maneuver, the retail powerhouse decided to adapt its plans. Instead of being obstructed, Macy's chose to work around the five-story building, effectively integrating it into the larger scheme of their expansion. The building's unique position at the corner of 34th and Broadway offered a chance for Macy's to send a clear message, and they embraced it. Over time, the building became more than just a holdout, it became a symbol of resilience. Today, this five-story building, while often unnoticed by the throngs of shoppers passing by, plays a significant role in Macy's brand identity. Through a lease agreement, the building proudly displays Macy's iconic shopping bag sign, declaring itself the world's largest store, an assertion rooted in both ambition and the history of the city. The building stands as a marker of Macy's expansion, but also a historical relic that tells the tale of a competitive era in New York's retail landscape. Number 1. The Highway Nail House Alright, this final homeowner is probably the most iconic. Luo Baojian's nail house, situated in the rapidly changing landscape of Wenling in the Zhejiang province in China, is an emblematic symbol of resistance against urban development. This lone, stubborn structure has captivated worldwide attention, showcasing the determination of Luo Baojian and his wife to hold on to their ancestral home. As the surrounding area transformed into a construction zone marked by the sprawling expansion of a new road and commercial building project, Luo Baojian and his wife became the last inhabitants clinging to their house. They adamantly refused to sell their property, even when lucrative compensation offers were extended. This small, simple dwelling became a nail house, protruding as a poignant reminder of the resistance amidst the upheaval. For decades, he and his wife nurtured their home, creating memories and building connections with the land. 
this connection proved unyielding despite the construction chaos enveloping them. The standoff between his family and the developers symbolizes that complex interplay between personal attachment and the wave of progress. Their resilience showcased the limits of development's reach. This nail house garnered international attention and became an icon of the broader struggle between individual property rights and rapid urbanization. Photographs of the house standing defiantly in the middle of the construction site captivated the world, leading to discussions on the balance between development and preservation. Ultimately, Luau Baojin's nail house was demolished in 2013 and the family was relocated. Yet, its impact lingers, inspiring conversations about the importance of recognizing the personal and cultural significance of homes, even in the face of transformation. The nail house stands as not only a physical structure, but as a testament to the resiliency of ordinary individuals in the face of change, reminding us to always balance progress with respect for the human stories entwined with the land. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you to our channel members.